Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth session in American English Live Series 18. We are so excited that each of you are here with us today. My name is Chris, and I'll be with you today, along with my colleague behind the scenes, Dorea, who will be the moderator, helping answer your questions and responding to your comments during the session. Let's begin today with some wonderful audience comments from our most recent webinar, Thinking Critical About Illustrations with Hema Ramanathan. First up, we have a wonderful comment from Loveline in Cameroon. The session was insightful and inspiring. It has given me insights on how to choose visuals for my lessons, as well as the different art elements to take into consideration when asking questions about those visuals. Thank you. Thank you, Loveline. Next up, we have Brigitta from Romania. This webinar has been a real eye-opener for me. I've been teaching with pictures for a long time, but it has never occurred to me how much guiding questions can add to learners. That's wonderful. And last up, we have Snowe from Pakistan. As a result of this session, my knowledge of successful English language teaching techniques has really increased. The tips will benefit my professional growth, and I'm looking forward to using them in my lessons. Thank you for providing this priceless chance for professional development and education. So we love to see our teacher participants actively engaged in professional development. So please continue to share your thoughts about our webinars by offering feedback through the end of session quiz form or by emailing them to American English webinars at fhi360.org. We may feature one of your comments during the next session. Throughout series 18, we have been exploring the themes of social emotional learning and integrating critical thinking in ELT. We hope you are able to use the practical ideas that we share. Before we begin today, we want to remind everyone that daylight saving time ends in the United States on November 5th. This means that the last session in our webinar series may have a different start time in your local area. We will broadcast at 8 a.m. and 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on November 15th, but it may start one hour earlier than usual where you are. Please use the time converter link being shared by the moderator to confirm your local start time. Be sure to enter the webinar date, November 15th, when using the converter tool. So here's what to expect today. The session is about 60 minutes long. The presenter will present the material, and I, as your host, will ask questions and make comments too. But we really hope to hear from you, our audience, so that we can address your ideas and experiences. Please share your thoughts using the comments feature or chat box. When our session comes to a close, you'll have an opportunity to receive a digital badge for your participation. At the end of the webinar, we'll share a link in the comments. Click on that link and complete a short quiz about today's session. You must answer two out of three multiple choice questions correctly. Once you have successfully passed the quiz, you can expect to get your badge via email within about a week. Now for today's webinar, I wonder, activities that teach young learners to think critically. Young students are naturally curious. Engaging children's questions and curiosity is the first step to teaching them how to think critically about the world around them. Teaching critical thinking skills to young learners provides an important foundation for media literacy, working with people from diverse backgrounds, complex academic thinking, and more. To develop these critical thinking skills, teachers can provide frequent opportunities to explore different perspectives, ask questions, gather information, and discuss their thinking with others. In this session, participants will learn how to use simple visuals, comics, and interactive activities to help young children to develop basic critical thinking skills while teaching English language skills. And we are pleased to introduce our presenter, Adrian Johnson. Adrian is an associate professor, TESOL coordinator, and chair of the Department of Education at Missouri Western State University. 
She specializes in preparing ELT educators to teach in content and language integrated learning settings. Adrian has taught child and adolescent English learners in rural and inner city public schools in multiple contexts. She is trained in cognitive coaching, mediation, and conflict resolution, and works with new and experienced teachers from diverse backgrounds to support the professional growth. Adrian is a certified K-12 teacher. She has a master's degree in education from National Lewis University, as well as a master's degree and doctorate in linguistics from the University of Kansas. Welcome, Adrian. Thank you, Chris, and welcome to all of you participants. Thank you so much for joining us today. When I look at this picture of this young boy playing with this device, I remember that one of the reasons why I love to teach is because children are so curious. Watching their eyes shine when they learn new information is rewarding. They have such big hearts and they wonder or want to know and learn about the world around them. They are funny and they are creative. In today's session, we will learn how to help children use their natural curiosity and sense of wonder to help them understand new and complicated ideas. These are critical thinking skills that are very important as children grow up in a world with access to a lot of information that is not always true or not always fully based in fact. We have a lot to do today, so I'm excited to, that you are joining us. We have three main goals. One is in this session, we will learn how to choose classroom materials that encourage critical thinking. This is very important in the first step. Then, we will use visuals to support critical thinking. And finally, we will plan some activities that practice critical thinking. So are you feeling curious today, Chris? Oh, Adrian, absolutely. I'm definitely feeling curious today. That's great because you are going to have to use those critical thinking skills today. I look forward to it. <laughs> great. So, Young learners are really curious. They make observations, they ask questions, they make predictions, and they make decisions. In other words, they wonder. And all of these actions require critical thinking skills. So participants, I hope you are also feeling curious today. Before we start with this session, I want you to think about your own students. Sometimes our students can wonder or think about simple topics. Sometimes they wonder or think about complicated or complex topics. So I want you to think about your students. What do your young learners wonder about? What questions do they ask about? Yeah, everybody, let us know in the chat. Um, we want you to think about your students. So what do young learners wonder about? Or what do they think about their life at home or at school, at work? We'd love to hear from you. So please let us know in the chat. And Adrian gave us a nice sentence starter. If you want to complete that, young learners wonder about what? We'd love to hear you and read out your wonderful comments. Let's see, Adrian. Um, let's see, we have Rosa saying, as you said in the beginning, um, curiosity is natural. So students wonder about everything. And we have a wonderful participant, Nala Nassar, saying uh, young learners wonder about space. And she's referring to her young, uh, her young children. That's wonderful. That's really great. Lots of uh, participants and teachers in our audience are giving you greetings, Adrian, saying hello from all wonderful places around the world. Um, see lots of different countries represented. It's wonderful. Let's see uh, what other people are wondering about Adrian. So, um, so students for Karima Bursky, she, she says in every lesson, students wonder what they're going to be doing today. They say, teacher, what are we, they wonder what we're doing today. And then we have Elrith Galvande Garcia says, 
Young, young learners think about nature, how things are made, and in general, they are curious about everything that they are interested in. Uh, we have Cesar Alfonso Zambrano says, my learners are curious and wonder about family members, colors, animals, numbers. So that's wonderful. And I'll read one more. These are all great comments, everybody. Um, Juan Martinez says, in order to build rapport with us, they tend to ask about different activities we perform out of school or if we want to know about their likes. So these are all wonderful comments, everybody. This is so great that what your young learners wonder about. Thank you so much. Yes, I love those answers. I think what you saw in that is one of the participants said they wonder about everything. And it's so true. They want to know what they're doing in your lesson today. They want to know about things that are in their own lives and at home. And some of them wonder about space or big ideas that maybe they don't know a lot about. So as teachers, we can help capture that wonder and help support it in our classrooms. So thank you for your participation. Okay, so let's get started about thinking about how do we encourage students to think critically. The very first step is we need to choose materials for our classrooms that encourage critical thinking. Students who are wondering are thinking critically, but critical thinking is difficult. It is difficult because critical thinking happens when there are multiple possible right answers. There's not just one right answer. There are lots of possible answers. And this is difficult because students have to make decisions. Choosing the right materials can help learners to practice those critical thinking skills. So let's look at the materials in this picture. There are many different objects in this picture. If you look very closely, you can see different shapes, different textures, different colors. There are a variety of materials that can be combined in many different ways. This is important. They can be combined in many different ways. These materials support critical thinking and are called open-ended because they have multiple purposes. So for example, if I have a string in my classroom, I can use that string to connect objects and connect ideas. We can do a chart or a map in our classroom with a string, or I might create a picture. If you look carefully, you can see a triangle made of string, or maybe we can play a game with it. So all of these are open-ended and have multiple purposes. When we're choosing classroom materials, it is also important to choose materials from the outside or real world. One of you mentioned bringing nature into the classroom. That's perfect. Did you see my presentation? I think you thought about what I was thinking about. I love to bring nature into my classroom because it's authentic. It's real life. Where I am, the leaves change colors all year and they see leaves every day. So I ask my students to bring leaves into the classroom so we can ask questions about the leaves. And then we can think about why do the leaves change? What causes that? And how does that connect to how the world changes around us? So we can use materials that students know very well and use those materials to help students think critically in the classroom. So now it's your turn. I want you to think about your students and think about objects that they are familiar with from home or outside in nature, what would be some authentic or real life objects that you could bring into your own classroom? Yes, everybody, it's your turn now again. Um, let us know in the chat about what authentic objects from the real world do you bring into your classroom? Please let us know in the chat. We'd love to hear about the different authentic objects around the world that you all amazing teachers bring into your classroom. 
Let's see, Adrian. We have Hawa Magoti saying fruit. We have Zola Perez uh, Castellano saying food and clothes. We have Karen Polanco saying clothes, food, and tools. Uh, lots of food. Uh, Jackie Makey saying fruits. Uh, Jessamine is also saying clothes. We have Nala Nassar saying clothes for role playing, boxes for mystery objects. Ooh, Nala, I'd love to hear more about those boxes for mystery objects. Those are great. So lots of great responses coming in, Adrian, about different um, real world objects that they bring in the classroom. It's really wonderful, everybody. Thank you so much. Yeah, that box idea does sound very interesting. And I like the idea of bringing clothes for role play into the classroom. You could have one scarf, for instance, that you could use in multiple different ways. So students could think of an idea and then do it a play with it or act out a role play. These are great ideas. And food's always fun in the classroom too. Okay, so when we're thinking about choosing classroom materials, we also need to remember that critical thinking is very difficult for students. Their brains are still growing and sometimes their language proficiency might be a little bit low too. So we need to help them. One way that we can help our students is to give them lots and lots of visuals. I saw in the Mintimeter poll that many of you use pictures and images. That's great. We want to let students draw their ideas in the classroom, show pictures, and share videos. The reason we need these visuals and these creative materials is because critical thinking is more than just memorizing facts. Students must think about new ideas and they need to solve some problems. They have to be creative in order to think critically. So if you look at this picture of this boy, you can see on the ground, there are many different pieces to a circuit board, a parts of a computer. He doesn't seem to have any directions. He just has his brain and these crushed up computer parts all over the ground. So he needs to be creative and try to put the pieces together. So hopefully his computer works. I heard someone mention Legos at one point and giving students blocks to put together or a problem to solve can help them think in new or different or creative ways. So these types of materials can help students to be curious, to ask questions and to learn new information. So I want to hear from you. What are materials in your classroom that are visual or creative? Yes, it's your turn again, everybody. Let us know in the chat about the materials in your classroom. Are they visual or are they creative? We'd love to hear about the different types of materials in your classroom. So let us know if they're visual or creative or what they might be. We'd love to see what you have to say. So I just saw also, Adrian, the, the, the teacher who said that they um, used the box. They got that idea from a form article. So that's wonderful. Another great American English resource. So that's let's great. see. Um, let's see. Some people are saying the materials in their classroom are they're giving examples of both visual and creative. So I'm seeing um, lots of people saying both or giving other examples such as box boxes or pictures or as you said like building things for projects uh, we have someone saying paper cubes which is really nice someone also uses leaves in their classroom too so that's wonderful um, and then someone else is saying pictures showing actions um, this one's interesting i'm not so sure what it is zigzags and bridges um, that sounds interesting. So lots of great uh, types of materials, both visual and creative from our audience. Thank you so much, everybody. Yeah, those are great. I like to just go to the grocery store and look around and see what I can use from the store to, to bring into my classroom sometimes. So those are some great ideas. If you don't mind, too, there's a couple other great comments I'd love to share with you, Adrian. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, we have Justin and Jasmine saying that uh, I often use character caricatures or memes to fuel my students' curiosity and critical thinking. I 
I think that's great. So, um, and here's another kind of uh, pro tip, I think, with the clothes. Zoila Perez Castellano says, in order to avoid carrying heavy things or heavy clothes, you can take, uh, you can use clothes from a doll. So that's quite interesting. Um, so yeah, lots of great comments. Thank you so much, everybody. That's perfect. That's a great pro tip to use doll clothes. Absolutely. I'm going to remember that one. Thank you. Yeah, that's those are those are great ideas. Okay, so let's um let's look at some new ideas for choosing some classroom materials. And this time, I want to ask Chris if you've ever had students work together or work collaboratively in your class. And can you give an example? Yeah, sure. Of course, I, I often have my students work together in class on various different types of group projects. Um, I like to assign them roles. Um, for example, they might be reading a short story, and I might give a role as like a timekeeper, or the vocabulary person comes up where they find new words. I like to give them fun names like word wizard. Um, I like to have the students draw, as you mentioned, too. So I might assign one of the students the role as an artist, and then maybe there's a presenter. So yeah, lots of times. I love to have this collaborative uh, classroom atmosphere in my classes, absolutely. Yeah, that's great, Chris. And I think if I walked into your classroom, I would see students are very engaged and they're interested because they all have a role to play and they're helping each other. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think you absolutely would see lots of collaboration in the classroom. That's great. And that's really important for critical thinking too, because critical thinking is challenging. So sometimes it helps if students can work with a partner instead of working by themselves in silence. When they can talk to a partner or practice together, then they can solve problems together and they can often help each other learn too. Sometimes the way the teacher explains something, the students don't understand, but a student can explain to another student in a way that really they understand better. They're very good at explaining new ideas to each other. And you don't have to have collaborative activities every day or every lesson. Many of these materials, you can just pick one that's creative or one that's collaborative, but you don't have to do it all the time. So I want you to think about that. I've given you some examples of types of materials that you can use in your own classroom. They can be open-ended or authentic or visual or creative and or collaborative. You don't need to use them all, but think for next week's lessons, what types of materials could you bring into your classroom to help with critical thinking? Yes, everybody, it's your turn again. We've got a great list of materials from Adrian, lots of things that you guys can use next week. So which ones are you all excited to try? Let us know in the chat. Are they open-ended, authentic, visual, creative, or collaborative? We'd love to hear what you guys are excited about. Let's see, from um, we have from Karima, Adrian. She's looking forward to using authentic materials. That's great. And Nala is saying visual materials. Daniela is saying authentic materials. We have Natalia Thomas is saying she's going to try to use Instagram profiles. That sounds really interesting. Um, so lots of uh, interesting materials, both digital, visual, and authentic. Um, and then, yeah, Jackie is saying visual and collaborative. Marco Antonio is saying combination. So I think everyone's really excited about the types of uh, materials they're going to use in their class. Thank you so much, everybody. Yeah, that's great. I know that Instagram or someone mentioned using memes before, using those type of materials. We're going to talk about social media and uh, comics or types of memes that how we can use them in the classroom too. So those are some great ideas. Okay, so up next, we are going to learn about how to use visuals to support critical thinking. So do you remember when I said that young learners like to make observations, ask questions, make predictions, and make decisions? Well, visuals can help with all of these. These are all critical thinking skills, 
And visuals often help to the students to understand those difficult skills. I'm going to show you some examples for how to use visuals to help young learners specifically make observations, ask questions, and make predictions. So let's get started. Okay, Chris, it's time to put your critical thinking hat on. I'm going to, yep, there you go, good job. <laughs> so we're going to practice what we can do with a picture. So I'm gonna ask you first to look at this picture and tell me what information the picture can tell us. Importantly, I only want you to tell me what you observe in the picture, only facts that you can see. So don't make any guesses, okay? Okay, I'm ready. So All only right. so only things I observe, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so I see, well, you said the term earlier. So I see a, a, a circuit board with wires. I see a red wire, a black wire, a green wire. Um, I see two hands of a person, a watch on the wrist of that person. I see some blue handles of a tool. Um, I see a yellow box, maybe some kind of microchip. It looks like a microchip to me. So those are the things that I notice that I see. Yeah, that's good. Good. So you're showing you're you're naming objects and you're using good vocabulary to describe this picture. So can you tell me why he's building this or doing this activity? Not factually, I can guess. So no, I can't tell you why he's building or she's building this. Yeah, that's really important. We don't know why this person is building this circuit board. This picture can tell you some facts, but if we want to learn more, we're going to have to make some guesses. So in a moment, we're going to try an activity, but you need to understand the difference between a fact and an inference. So a picture can tell us facts. It can tell us who is in the picture, what is in the picture, and what they are doing. For instance, like Chris just said, there is a person in this picture and they're putting together wires and maybe a microchip. Maybe they're making a circuit board. However, we don't know why they are putting this together. We also don't really know the steps they're using. In order to guess why they are putting this circuit board together, we have to make something called an inference. An inference is an informed guess. We can look at this picture and we can make a prediction or a guess about what happened before or after this picture. But that's just a guess. We have to infer information that is not in the picture. Facts, observations, do not usually require critical thinking. You only need to name information that you can easily see. Deciding how or why something is happening, though, does require critical thinking. And this is called inferences. For an inference, you have to make a connection between facts and what you know about the world. Your brain has to think of many different options why this person is doing what they're doing. Adrian, we got a great comment coming in um, from one of our participants, Nala Nassar, saying, yes, this is great. This is quite similar to the distinction between lower and higher order thinking skills where making inference or guessings would be HOTS or higher order thinking skills. I think absolutely. Yeah, that is perfect. If you've heard of Bloom's taxonomy, so facts are at the bottom, knowledge and understanding, and inferences are a little bit higher on that triangle, higher level thinking. That's perfect. When we're talking about critical thinking, we are talking about HOTS or higher level thinking. That's a great connection. Good job. So one of my favorite ways to help students with critical thinking is by asking good questions. You can use two simple questions to activate critical thinking. 
One is you can just ask students, how do you know? So if you think that the person is building a circuit board for a reason, I can ask students, how do you know? What clues are you using to make your guess or your inference? I might also ask students, why? Why do you think someone is doing this? Or why might this be important? So let's try a strategy. Let's put that information together in a strategy. First, I'm going to explain the strategy. Then Chris and I are going to practice. So Chris is going to have to do some critical thinking again. <laughs> yep, there's your hat, good job. And then participants, I'm going to have you do some critical thinking too. So watch first, and then I look forward to your answers. So this first strategy is called observed or inferred. The purpose of this strategy, the purpose of this strategy is to use critical thinking to help students understand and practice the difference between observations and inferences. The first step for this strategy is just to choose an interesting picture. Then once you have an interesting picture like the one I have here, you can ask students what they see or observe in the picture. Finally, you can ask students to make inferences or guesses about the picture. Okay, Chris, it's your turn. We are going to start with just practicing observations. I want you to tell me what you observe about the picture. You can use some of the sample questions and sentence stems to help you, but don't make any guesses, only tell me what you can see. All right, sounds good. Well, first of all, you definitely chose an interesting picture. That's for sure, Adrian. I love this picture. Um, so for observing, I see two birds uh, in this picture. I see a body of water. Um, I see that the birds are white. Um, and I see that the birds' beaks are touching each other. Um, Yes, and I see that they're they're flying. There, there's movement there. Yeah, I like it. So those are all observations. Those are facts. So you and I can see the same things. But now let's try some critical thinking. So with critical thinking, we want to know what can you infer. Remember that an inference is an informed guess. For an inference, you can use the picture and what you know about the real world. For instance, I might ask you, what are the birds doing? You can answer that question or any of the ones that you see here. All right, sounds good. Um, so guessing or making an inference, I'm thinking of two things. I'll share both of them with you. Um, my, my prediction or what I'm thinking the birds are doing is that they are, are sharing a meal or a snack. Uh, the birds are sharing perhaps a fish that one of them caught in the water. Um, on the other hand, I might infer that the birds are fighting or one of the birds is trying to take the food from another bird. It looks like one is on top of it. So I know this, that maybe they're fighting the one on to the left is grabbing the food, perhaps a fish or something else from that other bird. Yeah, those are great. And what's really great about this and why this is critical thinking is because there's lots of possible answers here. The birds could be helping each other or they could be fighting against each other. And you can see there are some sentence stems that use simple language and some that use more complicated language. Asking students to explain their thinking and why they think that can also help to raise the language. So there are many different benefits to this strategy. One is of course, it helps them think critically. There are lots of different possible answers and you can ask them why they think what they think or how do they know? But for language teachers, observations are a great way to practice descriptive language and inferences are an excellent way to practice complex sentences using visuals. We have a question coming in, Adrian, before we get on to the next. Um, someone's commenting, Karima saying, this is a wonderful, great activity. 
but uh, they are wondering if um, they should provide their students with vocabulary on the image to, to help them to be more engaged in speaking. What would you recommend for that? Yeah, I love that. So one of the other strategies I don't talk about in this session in detail, but I'll briefly summarize, is when I give students a picture, often I have them label the picture first. So they can take little post-it notes or sticky notes or cards and they can draw, or they can even just write on the picture, write some vocabulary, and then they can use that vocabulary in the sentences that I provide. Sounds great, thank you so much. Absolutely. So for instance, we might even start with this picture. We might label the fields or the path or the houses and the children who are wearing raincoats. So we might do that as a first step. And then I would ask students or participants, you're the students now, right? What do you observe and what can you infer? So participants, you can use the sentence stems I gave you and talk to me a little bit or write about this picture. What do you observe and what can you infer? Yes, everybody, it's your turn again. So from this picture, let us know what you observe or what do you infer from this picture. So let's see, Adrian, we've got some people saying that they are observing um, houses, children. Lots of people are saying, I see four children running. I see happy children. I think that's an in inference. They're, they're, they're happy. Um, let's see what else we see. Nature, as you mentioned, a house, um, the path and the fields. Someone's guessing that the fields is a, a field of wheat. Um, and then some people are just saying that they like the colors of the raincoat. Um, let's see, children running with raincoats in great, wonderful, bright colors of those raincoats. So I think everybody's making some good observations of, of what they see. Um, and then Eric John Perez is saying that their shadow can be seen in a picture, which means that the weather is warm. That's an interesting observation. Um, so lots of great responses, everybody. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, those were some great observations. If I was in the classroom, I could then ask my students, okay, so what do you infer? And one of you have said the children are happy. As Chris said, that's an inference. It doesn't say they're happy but we can look at their faces and guess that they are happy. And I love the science teacher in me. I used to teach science. The science teacher in me loves the idea of the shadows. So they are wearing raincoats. And so we might guess that they are running because it's going to rain. But I can use my understanding about the real world to know if, it, if we see their shadows, it's a sunny day. So maybe it's not going to rain. So I have to think critically and make inferences based on the picture and what I know about the world. Okay, so that was fun. Let's try another strategy. This one's called using comics to make predictions. This is a comic strip, it's the first part of it, that an 11 year old drew. We are going to try to tell a story with pictures then we are going to make some predictions about what comes next in this comic. The purpose of this comic is to practice inferences, predictions, and explain why or how they make those inferences and predictions. All of this requires some critical thinking. So again, our steps are, first, we are going to decide what is happening in the picture. Next, we are going to make some predictions about what happens next. And then if we have advanced students, we're going to ask how they know that. And guess what, Chris? I'm going to have you practice for the participants. Are you ready? I'm ready, putting my thinking cap up back on. Okay, so we're going to do this in partners, which we can do in the classroom too. Let's get started. Okay, Chris. So I we have a picture here and I want you to tell me a story. I want you to tell me what you think is happening in this story. Okay, um, so in this first picture, I, I see a person named Billy and his dog Pepper. It, it looks to me 
like Billy wants to take Pepper for a walk. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so we have Billy and Pepper. Let's see the next picture. Oh no, Billy went for a walk, but there were lots of dogs. What do you think oh, is no. happening? Oh no, lots of dogs. Okay, so in this picture, it, it looks like Billy is, is flying through the air. Um, perhaps because of the lots of dogs, he's being pulled, pulled away from because there are so many dogs there. Yeah, that's what it looks like. I wonder what's going to happen to Billy. Let's look at the next picture. Oh, okay. Well, Pepper's back home, but where is Billy? Well, that's a good question. Where is Billy? <laughs> <laughs> so, Chris, I want you to make a prediction. And you could draw the next step, or you could just tell me what's happening. What do you think is going to happen next? Okay. Um, I predict that. Billy comes back home and he brings a few of those other dogs that he got perhaps tangled up with. But Pepper didn't want the other dogs to come in. So maybe the next picture is dogs outside the house and then Pepper and Billy back inside the house. Oh, I hope that Billy is ready for all those new dogs at his house. <laughs> <laughs> Me so, too. Yeah. So why do you think that Pepper, and why do you think there might be more dogs coming to this house? You can say, I think Billy, or I think Pepper brought more dogs because? Okay, I think um, Pepper brought more dogs because Pepper's a friendly dog, and he became friends with these other dogs. And even though Billy went flying through the air, Billy's a really nice boy, and the, all the other dogs liked him. So I think they all went back to their house because of that. That's great. That was a lot of fun, Chris. Thanks for playing along with me. Thank you. So let's summarize what we did here so that you can use this in your own classroom. So when we use comics to make inferences and predictions and practice critical thinking, we want to start with a few steps, okay? So first, we tell what is happening in the story. We don't have the answers, so this requires some inferences or critical thinking. Next, we make some predictions. This is also critical thinking. And finally, for our advanced students, we can use more critical thinking to ask them how they know that or why they think that. This is a fun and engaging activity that practice inferences at every step. So and we've how got a, you could we've use- We've got a great comment. I'm sorry to interrupt, Adrienne. No we just, I wanna share some wonderful comments. Lots of our audiences just say they love this activity. They love this strategy. Um, one person is commenting that this will encourage their learners to improve their grammar in a fun and engaging way instead of just writing rules on the board. So lots of thanks to you for sharing that great activity. Yeah, I, I love that. I, I think that this is a great, way to start for a writing activity to get students to really want to write and read each other's stories so that you can practice reading too. So how would you use comics in your own classroom? I just gave you an idea maybe, but can you think of more ideas? Yeah, everybody, let us know. Adrian just gave us a great idea, great activity using comics in the classroom. How about you? How could you use comics in your classroom to help critical thinking? We'd love to see what you all are thinking, what you want to do in your classroom. Um, let's see. We have um, Eric John Palvarez is saying it's a, a, as a warm-up activity, it might be really useful too to get students, uh, their minds activated. He's also saying really impressive activity. This is really good for perhaps slower learners or learners that might be struggling. Um, so lots of really good ideas. Um, we have someone else saying using like body parts of the animals, perhaps in comics to, to guess their names. Um, and then we have Allison that they can use comics to create their own story the same way with characters and vice versa. Um, we have Irene saying that they can use in reading novels or plays, dividing the comic uh, squares between scenes or chapters. Um, asking learners to draw some pictures and to tell their partners to answer some questions. 
let's see, there's lots of great ideas coming in here, Adrian. I think everyone really likes this activity. Um, so yeah, for a writing activity, as you said, so the teacher might ask them to change the end of the story or to rewrite the story. I like doing that activity too. So lots of great responses of how our audience is going to use comics to help critical thinking. Thank you so much, everybody. Yeah, those are some great ideas. We have to write all of those down and make a book together, all the participants <laughs> with all your great ideas. I know in my own classroom, one thing that I used to do is use comics for listening comprehension too. So one of the participants mentioned writing kind of steps or sequencing in a story so they can listen to the story and then draw what they're hearing is happening. So that's another great idea. Okay, so we've talked so far about how to choose materials and use visuals. Next, we're going to practice a couple activities to help students practice critical thinking. So remember, these are skills that we want young learners to practice because we want them to develop those critical thinking activities. We want them to make observations and ask questions and make predictions and make decisions. One of the things that can help with this is to have students work collaboratively in partners or groups to develop those critical thinking skills. So for this next activity, we are going to talk about the difference between facts and opinions. So it's important that you have a good definition for that. So facts are observable. They are the same for you and for me and for Chris. Facts are the same for everyone. Opinions are thoughts. Different people can have different ideas about the same topic. Students need critical thinking to know the difference between a fact and an opinion. They might think something's a fact, but really it's an opinion. And these skills are really important for understanding the news or what they see on social media. So I always like good pictures. So we're going to use visuals to practice the difference between facts and opinions. If we look at this picture, we can state some observable facts. We've been practicing this. So for instance, I can say there are many leaves in this picture and the leaves are many colors. Those are facts. We can also share some opinions. Different people have different opinions about the same topic or picture. Therefore, opinions are different from facts. So for instance, I can say that the purple leaf is the most beautiful. And I can see, Chris, do you agree or disagree with me? Which one do you think is the most beautiful? Well, I do agree that the purple leaf is beautiful, but I disagree that it's the most beautiful. My, what I think is the most beautiful, my opinion is the multicolor leaf right below the purple leaf. I like all the different colors in that one leaf, the red and the yellows and the greens. I think that one's the most beautiful leaf. I love that. And I love the sentence stem you used. You said, my opinion is, and that's a great stem to teach students when they're answering that question. Okay. So our next strategy is sorting facts and opinions. So we are going to use critical thinking to understand and practice the difference between a fact and an opinion. And get ready, audience, because I'm going to ask you to do this. So here are the steps. First, we're going to pick an interesting topic. Then, of course, we have to pick some good pictures. Next, we are going to look at those pictures and write some sentences on cards. Importantly, some of these sentences are facts and some of the sentences are opinions. We give those cards to students and they can work in partners or a group to sort or divide the cards into facts or opinions. So we're going to practice today 
This is an activity that your students can try. You would give them a topic. So my topic today is the four seasons. We have lots of different seasons where I live, fall, winter, spring, and summer. So I picked a picture for each of these seasons. You want to write some statements on the cards. So you see some statements here like snow is cold or warm water is relaxing. And you decide which of these statements are fact and which are opinion. So let's try it in the chat. What are some facts in this list? Yeah, everybody, take a look at this list and let us know in the chat which one of these statements is a fact. Please let us know which one you think is a fact. Let's see, we have um, Mega Mark is saying winter is colder than summer. <laughs> so that's, uh, he thinks that's a fact. Um, let's see what else. Daniela is saying snow is cold, as well as Karima saying snow is cold. Also, they're saying as a fact. Um, Delia Spinoza saying winter is cold. Lots of people saying that uh, statement, snow is cold and winter is colder than summer. Um, so lots of people are, are they, are they right, Adrian? Yeah, so let's check the answers. So for sure, I know 100% snow is cold is a fact. <laughs> That's because snow is frozen water. The other ones, when we do these activities, I start to wonder. So. I think flowers are colorful is a fact, but some people might look at this and say, well, they're all yellow, so maybe they're not colorful. Or for some, winter is colder than summer. In some places, it may not be. It may be the same temperature. So that might be more of an opinion. The most important part here is that it takes critical thinking to sort facts and opinions. And sometimes we might have for advanced students, some more complicated sentences, like climate change is preventable. This is complicated because some climate change is preventable, but some may not be. So this could lead to a good debate with students. And that's what I wanna talk about next. And it's okay if you didn't get those all right, we can have a good debate about it later. <laughs> So the last strategy that I want to share with you is student debates. Student debates are great for critical thinking. They help students to understand different perspectives and to find evidence to support their ideas. Debates require students to find evidence and understand the difference between facts and opinions. So the first step to creating an interesting debate is to pick an interesting topic that has multiple different perspectives. And then of course, we have to pick good visuals or pictures. The second step is we want students to find facts or evidence to support their per perspective. They can do this in a group or in partners. Because this is a little bit challenging, we want to give them some vocabulary and some sentences to help them. Then we let students work together and prepare a debate, and then they can debate with each other in class. So I've picked pictures to help with a debate. I can show students an interesting topic like which pollution is worse, air, water, or soil. I can put my students into three groups. Group A, researches about air pollution. Group B, water pollution. And group C, soil pollution. Then I can ask my students which pollution is worse. Blank pollution is worse because... They will have to answer that question by doing some research. I can give them videos and pictures or readings and media, online sources. They can interview people affected by pollution or they can observe their natural environment. Importantly, and this is critical thinking, 
I would have to help my students understand what is a good source of information? What is fact-based, like a researcher or a journalist would use? Versus what is a source that is less reliable, like a friend's opinion? When students are done with their research, they can face each other and debate. Remember, I need to give them some sentence stems, vocabulary, and some visuals to help them. Finally, they prepare their debate with fact-based evidence. So do we have time to practice, Chris? Yeah, I think so. And I'm seeing lots of comments already coming in on Facebook with lots of opinions about which pollution, but go for it. Lead us yeah. off, Adrian. Okay, so let's look at these pictures. There's air pollution, soil pollution, and water pollution. We don't have a lot of time for research, so you are going to need to use your background knowledge. And I know all of these pollutions are bad, but I want you to tell me which one do you think is worse? Air, water, or soil pollution? Share your opinion and at least one fact to support your opinion. You can use the sentence stems that I'm giving you here. Yeah, everybody, it's your turn again. So let us know, do you think air pollution, water pollution, or soil pollution is worse? And why? As Adrian said, please include at least one fact to support your opinion. So let's see, lots of people are giving their opinions. Adrian, I'm going to find one that also has a fact too. So um, let's see. Well, so lots of people are agreeing with you that these they are all really bad because they affect our environment. Um, let's see what else we have coming in. Um, Mohammed Faisal is saying, obviously air pollution and water pollution, it's bad for our health because we inhale. It affects our lungs and dirty water affects our bodies too. And then we have Jackie Mecky saying, I think water pollution is worse because it's not good for your health. And then we have uh, from Daniela, um, air pollution is worse because that's the one that affects us more quickly and it could potentially harm us very, very quickly within seconds. Without water, we can still survive for a couple hours even if it's polluted. Um, lots of interesting comments. We have um, Nareem saying water pollution because we need to drink water and water goes inside our bodies. That's why it's uh, the worst in their opinion. So lots of great, uh, great opinions and adding some facts too. Thank you so much, everybody. Yeah, those are some great ideas and evidence as well and, and explanations. Something that I might do when students say all pollution is bad is I might tell them something that's real life or authentic, such as maybe you only have $1 million. That sounds like a lot of dollars, but you have to fix a problem in the world that's air pollution related or water pollution related. Which one do you choose? Where do you put that money? That's something that people have to decide is which issue do we fix first if we only have a limited amount of, of funds. So we are almost done. So thank you for staying with us. Let me go ahead and summarize everything that we've learned today. So remember, as we finish today, that choosing the right materials is very important. You want to choose materials that are open-ended, authentic, visual, creative, and collaborative. You also want to plan activities that help learners to make observations, ask questions, make predictions, and make decisions. If you choose the right materials and you plan the right activities, your students are going to be able to think critically, even if their language proficiency is a little bit lower. So in this session today, we learned a lot. We learned how to choose classroom materials, use visuals, and plan activities, all to support students' critical thinking. I hope you enjoyed this session today, and I hope you try some critical thinking activities in your own classroom soon. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Adrienne. Thank you so much for helping us learn to use simple visuals, 
comics and these great interactive activities to help young children develop basic critical thinking skills while also teaching English language skills. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Adrian.